Oh, good good morning. Um, this is Senate Judiciary. This is Tuesday, March 30th, 2021, as we zoom towards April. Um, and uh, our subject this morning is uh, H20, uh, which is a bill dealing with uh, risk assessments pre uh, risk assessments, and S-27, which creates a pilot project for risk assessments, free um, <clears throat> sentencing. Yes. Yeah. H-20 is free adjudication. So right. Eric, why don't you kind of go through the, if you have a new um, version? Yes, I do, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to uh, talk to the committee about, as the chair mentioned, uh, House Bill number 20 and S Bill number 127. Uh, what you have in front of you now, and I'll pull it up in a moment so that I can uh, share the screen so you can see the language, but just a quick moment about uh, the amendment you're looking at. This is a strike all amendment. Remember House Bill 20, H20, uh, was the bill that affected risk assessments and pretrial services. The two things going on in that bill are the, um, the modification of risk assessments so that they become uh, discretionary rather than mandatory, and that the universe of folks to whom they apply uh, is only going to be people, I'm sorry, that the risk assessments themselves would only be used to determine uh, whether someone uh, was likely to reappear, whether they are at risk of flight, as opposed to taking out the former use of them, which had been. Uh, to determine risk of reoffense, so the the use of risk asset the risk assessment tool is focused in those two ways, as well uh, the pretrial services element of that bill. Remember, make sure that uh, pretrial services are available for people eighteen and nineteen year olds in particular uh, who are charged as juveniles. Remember, because all the work you've done in juvenile law over the years, some of those older folks are going to be able to be charged as juveniles in the family division they wouldn't otherwise be avail able to get pretrial services without this change in the law. So this is just to make sure that pretrial services are available to those uh, older older folks as well when they're charged as juveniles. And the, the last piece that Senator Sears mentioned is to fold into the strike call amendment, Senate bill number 121, which is the pilot project uh, that the uh, Department of Corrections, the court, and we're adding the state's attorneys, defender general, um, attorney general as well to consult and pick a pick a, a criminal division or two a unit in the criminal division to participate in this pilot project where the uh, department of corrections would provide the court prior to sentencing somebody uh, for a uh, to probation for a felony uh, with a report that would include the risk assessment um, uh, any uh, any need screenings and the criminal history records of the person uh, so that the court can have that information available uh, when the court makes uh, decisions about conditions of probation. So that's the piece from S-127 that gets folded into H-20 in the amendment you have in front of you. So that's the big picture. Um, should I take a quick look at the language center, Sears? Yeah, please. All right, we'll do, I'll pull that up. All right, so you should see in front of you now the, the strike all amendment to H20. So the, and you'll see there's only a couple of changes other than the addition of S127, but I'll quickly run through everything. You remember that the, because the risk assessment tool is being scaled back, many of the references to risk assessment in the current statute, the, the current uh, pretrial services statute uh, are struck because they're, they're not necessary anymore. So that's all you see in front of you there in the struck language on page one. But the sort of the key point here is right here in subsection B, this is the point I mentioned earlier that you see under existing law, if you look at page two lines, say three and four primarily, or, or two to four, the, the language that's struck through, the existing procedure is that uh, if someone's been um, unable, you know, they're arrested, lodged, unable to post bail for 24 hours, now I'm on line two, they shall be offered a risk assessment 
and if deemed appropriate by the pretrial service, services coordinator, the need screening. But the point there is that they shall be offered the risk assessment. You know, that's the mandatory point that I mentioned earlier. The new language that's underlined, you go back above a little bit to line 20. In this case, um, it, the judge may request that a pretrial services coordinator perform the risk assessment. So that's that first change. It goes from mandatory um, to discretionary. It's not required that they be offered. The court may offer it, or may request that it be performed. And you'll see that it, they perform a risk assessment that assesses risk of, risk of flight. That goes from line 21 to one. So again, that's the other point about risk assessment. It's not just, it, it's only assessing risk of flight. It's not assessing um, risk of reoffense any longer. Yeah. I, I may have a rather, well, go ahead, Senator Nick. I have a question on that. The, the judge may request it. And if he does request it, 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 that means the person has to have it. Is that correct? No, the, the person is never, even under existing law, the person, person is not required okay. uh, to participate. Uh, that's a, a constitutional right they have. They, they can always decline. Um, so it, it's up to the defendant whether, whether they want to participate or not. And, and that's, but that's true under existing law as well. Okay. Eric, is, yeah. is there a, an adverse inference if someone declines? Uh, I don't think so, but that might be a good question for the witnesses. I, I, I don't, I don't think that the, that the, I don't know if, it, uh, if it actually was at trial, uh, you know, there's certainly a potential that a jury instruction could be given not to draw any adverse inference from that, but I'm not sure it would ever even come up. So, okay. Yeah. Is there a, this, this is for that small group of people that are held with bail, but can't make the bail. Is that correct? Right. That's the within 24 hours. Exactly. Right. So, so it's not yeah. not people held without bail. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. It's a, probably a pretty small universe of people. Hmm. Um, does anybody want to answer? Anybody who's a witness today who's online may want to answer Senator Bruce's question. Uh, I can what I can't see everybody, so whomever would like to just, just jump in. Matt Valerio. Matt, thank you. Yeah, it, it has no negative inference or anything on any, on anything. It, okay. Uh, I, I would agree, Ms. Judge Grierson. I, if someone elected not to take it, I, I can't foresee a judge making an adverse uh, response to that okay okay I, I and this may be getting to a point that the chair is um gonna drop in not too long from now but all of the work that we had done beforehand around bail was based on it seemed to me risk of you know harm in the community or public safety and and it does seem like this draft moves us even further away from that um or maybe I'm reading it wrong, but. Um, of course, the bail is supposed to be set only for, for factors relating to risk of flight um, as opposed to public safety. So the determination of cash bail, if you will, uh, is supposed to relate to, the, to that issue risk of flight. And if you think about it, under the present circumstances, I can't imagine a judge asking for the risk assessment if we know in advance that the pretrial services don't have the resources available to them to conduct a true risk assessment with the tool that they presently have. So um, I, I don't foresee this being used, uh, quite frankly, at all. In, until there's an improvement in the tool or the resources available in pretrial services. But we are talking about a very small, very small population. Yeah. This, this risk assessment too is only designed to deal with risk of flight. It doesn't deal with uh, any, anything else. What right. are the issues, what are, help me if I'm sounding naive, but what are the issues on risk of flight? 
I mean, the person lives in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and therefore is not likely to stick around for this small crime. Um, it's ties to the community. Do they have a job? Do they have a home? Do they do they have uh, um, even if they don't have a do they have some place to go? Even if they don't have a a job. Mm -hmm. Um, right. We look, we look at their their social and and you know criminal history, their ties to the community, um, you know resources available to them. Maybe you know they have family support. Um, are they uh, somebody who's just come in from out of state and have no ties or no uh, either employment or otherwise to the community? Um, the question is uh, th those types. Of socioeconomic issues. All right, thank you. Any other questions regarding page two? Senator Sears? Yeah. All of the things that have just been said forces me to ask the question, why are we doing this? Normally a pretrial services coordinator traditionally has been used to assess program issues. The arguments about whether someone is a risk of flight generally are made between the state's attorney and the defense counsel. And I, I can't see this new entity, um, shouldn't say new entity, new area of work for someone who is normally a services coordinator. Um, being used at all. I, I will agree with Judge Grierson. I, I just I can't understand why this would be used. It would almost delay because you're bringing a third party into an equation where the state's attorney and the defense counsel are already well prepped in making an argument to the judge about whether somebody is a risk of flight. I'll leave it at that. Anybody want to? I, yeah, I. This is David with the attorney, David Sherry, the Attorney General's yeah. office. To Senator, thanks, Senator. Uh, to Senator Benning's point, I mean, I think that's actually a fair point. You know, the a re, what we're amending here is what is currently a broader use of of this. You know, it's currently mandatory that it be done for this small category of people, and this is making it discretionary uh, at the judge's discretion. So it is actually a narrowing, but I think. Um, not a, it's not a new use of it. It's a, it's a more narrow use. But I, I think Senator Benning brings up a fair point about, you know, why, why are we doing it at all, given the realities on the ground. Uh, this provision was uh, recommended by House Judiciary to at least keep the option in case a judge wanted to use it or in case a defendant wanted to ask a judge to use it. Certainly, it's an amendment we had no opposition to. If, you know, if people want it available, that's fine. But I think Senator Benning's point is a fair one about the very limited utility of it. I feel like a doctor. Um, First priority is do no harm. Does it do any harm to have it in the law? What, Senator Pierce, could I uh, yep. comment briefly? One of the things that was important to uh, our office was to have it available for uh, youthful offenders. So you could have it drop down below, um, you know, the age, the, the where it's currently available, um, and uh, you know the the other portions of it uh, um, are are fine with us. We don't think it does any harm, uh, but we wanted to make sure that the rare occasion where a risk assessment might be useful to somebody who's being held who's a youthful offender, uh, we could get that risk assessment and present it to the judge as something outside of the representations of counsel and whatever witnesses that uh, they might bring to the table. Are we using youthful offender? You bring up, I'm uh, just curious, are, are we using youthful offender now that the changes took place in 2018? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's probably slowed down a little bit because of COVID, but uh, the uh, youthful offender status is being used somewhat regularly now. 
Matt, if I can just jump in with what you just said, if it's necessary, or you think there's a use for it in whatever event, I, I would look at line 20 and 21 on page one and say, it's not the judge who's requesting it. It's upon request, a judge may order that a pretrial services coordinator perform a risk assessment. Um, otherwise, it doesn't make sense that the judge would just do that willy nilly. Why not? Yeah, there's, I've got to flip down. I think there's another portion of this. Um, I think it does say the judge may request yeah. that the pretrial right. services. It, it, it yeah. says a judge may request pretrial services, uh, but usually that's upon request that the judge would order it, not that the judge would just suddenly pop up and say, I'm going to request. Who makes that request? I would believe it would either be the state or the defense. Okay. I mean, what if the judge feels it's in the best interest of the whole situation? So they ask for it. Yeah, I, I don't think the judge should be precluded from asking for it. Um, I don't think we need to, I think we're over. I do too. I, I think you know, if you I, just yeah, leave it in there. I, I think we're fine. Th this is all a May now. So it, it, they don't have to do it. I believe that some of the testimony was maybe at any given time, 80 people held with, that, with, with for cash bail because they can't make it. Huh? That was the count last week, Senator. I last week you. was around 80 people. Yeah. And of those 80, you know, there only may be Money where somebody would want to request this. That generally they wouldn't. I mean, you you already outlined what the reasons would be. I. Yeah, that population count is about the same today, uh, Senator. It's uh, total state detainees, 282. And I think you can figure that about 200 of those are held without. So Held without. Yeah. So about 80 of them would would be held on cash as of today. I mean, I think you can leave the provision in there and either the court can take advantage of it or not. I, I don't think it, it, it's certainly no, no harm in leaving it there. Understood, Your Honor. Note my objection for the record, please. <laughs> 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 Tomorrow, oh, Senator, Senator oh, Benning will be in court requesting one of these. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody that just got placed. We'll, deny his, we'll <laughs> deny his request. <laughs> you usually do. <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> you know, with your luck, Joe, somebody, some client of yours is going to get arrested tonight. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually $100 I'm actually, cash literally. bail, and you're going to want a risk assessment. The no, judge is going to uh, say, no. Yeah, I, I literally have one of those right now in Essex County that Vince and I are arguing about. So I'm, now I'm toying with how to use this, right? Okay. Um, why don't we move along, Eric, to section two? Yes, sure, absolutely. And just to, to sort of close the loop on this, as the, as the committee was noting that the general reduction in use of risk assessments here, I did follow up with Jeff Wallen at the Vermont Crime Information Center yesterday, and he, he did confirm that that the um, pretrial services coordinators are not able to access the criminal history records, and that's part of the reason for for this um, reduction in risk assessment use. Uh, but you'll see that that actually supports the the expanded use in the pilot project by Department of Corrections employees who who are able to access those records. Eric, so. Can you can you repeat that? My is my understanding that a risk coordinator, I'm not using the term properly, does not have access to prior criminal records. Yes, that's what. Then how yeah, are they going to make the how are they going to make the call for the judge on whether or not this person is a risk of flight? I think if I understand it correctly, that that's just going to be they'll they'll use the other other. Uh, facts and circumstances that go into the overall risk assessment report, but then have to note that that one sort of outstanding piece that's not in the assessment is criminal history, but other factors that I think your witnesses mentioned, you know, the 
ties to the community, uh, that sort of thing, that could all be in there. Uh, but that one particular piece, right, would not be would would uh, not be available to them and would would be noted. Well, just for the committee's edification, normally a criminal record check is going to include information about failures to appear in court. I can't imagine a more important component to that risk assessment now being asked. Could just be me. Well, but they can't get it under the under the law. No, even under the under the current law, that's right. right. They still under can't the get current it. law. They can't get the criminal history record because that's not available to the attorney general's office, but is available to corrections, which leads us right to section two. Right. Oh, just right before I get to section two, if I don't want to get lost, have this other piece get lost, you'll see the other thing going on in section one is the pretrial services piece. Remember, this is to make sure, and this is what you're looking at, subdivision C, uh, to uh, provide that uh, when a person, you know, because of the expansion of the juvenile jurisdiction statute, some 18 and 19 year olds uh, will be charged sometimes in the, in the family division as juveniles rather than as adults in the criminal division. And the way the statute is currently written, those folks uh, would not be able to access pretrial services. So this language is to make sure that, as you see, lines 18 to through line one, that uh, pretrial services can be engaged by a person 18 years of age or older who is the subject of a delinquency petition. So if you're charged as a juvenile, 18 or 19, then you can get pretrial services too. So that's just to, to uh, make that available to those defendants. Uh, so that's just a technical piece in line D there. So moving on to section two, as Senator Sears said, uh, this is the pilot project, the uh, report to the court. You'll see some highlighted language because the committee discussed last time about making sure that um, that the Department of Corrections consults not just with the court, but sheriffs and state's attorneys, uh, AG and Defender General uh, when establishing this pilot project and selecting which um, criminal division uh, or which uh, unit, I should say, within the criminal division to have the pilot project operate in. And the way the project works is that uh, the idea is that the department provides the court with a report before a defendant gets sentenced uh, to a term of probation for a felony. And that report you'll see in lines two to four has to include uh, defendant's risk assessment results, mental health and substance abuse disorder screening results, and criminal history. And the idea is that that report is going to assist the court when it sets uh, probation conditions. And again, tying up that last point, that uh, de the department does have access to criminal history records for purposes of putting together this risk assessment. And uh, if you remember, Senator Sears, your reading of this was correct. I checked with Dave DeMora at CSG that yes, this, this does require uh, in this pilot project uh, instance that the risk assessment and the screening results uh, are actually completed. Remember, we were discussing the idea of, well, is it, is it just that they're provided when available or they actually do they have to be done? And it's the latter, Dave confirmed. That was CSG's recommendation that the for this pilot project, at least, risk assessment and screening needs to be done and then they're sent along to the court um, for the probation decision. So uh, the, the uh, interested parties then work together to select one or two units to participate in the pilot project, and then they report on the results to joint justice oversight by December of 2022. I have one, one question, Eric. Yeah. If any of the folks could comment. If something happens and this becomes really successful. I'm thinking of some of the trials for the vaccine for COVID. Um, is there ability to move this quicker? And, you know, they find this is really helpful that it's, you know, getting people out on proper conditions. It's a good program, makes a lot of sense. We ought to do it statewide. Is there an ability to do it sooner? To come back, say, you know, next January and say the pilot's going well. Um, we think we should expand it statewide. 
Um, that's a good point. Uh, it doesn't, that isn't specifically addressed in the language as written. Um, it says but, honor before. Oh, that's true. Honor before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we I, could. I would think, Senator, um, that if this is, does prove successful, that the parties themselves would be the first ones to say, let's move this up. Let's, let's expand it. Um, okay. uh, I'm just curious if we should do an interim report. But we can leave on her before, I guess. Right. Given some of the things that we're going to have to vote on this year and next year, some of us may not be mapped. Uh, school pensions, I mean, teacher and state employee pensions. <clears throat> um, all right. All right. Any questions? So I, should I pull the screen down for now? Yeah, please, Eric. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I think we got a good bill. Uh, I did talk to Representative Grad yesterday. Um, she's aware that we're combining uh, both these issues into this one bill. And um, so. Is there a motion to report draft 1.1 favorably? I move we report draft 1.1 favorably as amended. Or no, we amend at H20 as seen in draft 1.1. Second. That's been moved and seconded. Thank you, Senator Baruth. Um, any discussion? Hearing none. I'm still a little uncomfortable about doing a risk assessment analysis with somebody who is deprived of the most important tool in the risk analysis. Um, I don't know what contribution they could make to that conversation. I'll hold my nose and vote for it anyway, but I'm, I'm still uncomfortable with that. And I just I guess I, I don't hear anybody else screaming that's a witness on the screen, but that that's all. I'm just in the mood to be contrary. Okay. Well, you certainly have every right to vote yes or no. Um, Peggy, could you please call the roll on the amendment? Senator Benning. Sure. <laughs> Senator Nika. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Senator Baruth. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. I was thinking of Senator Chittenden's nay vote today. Yeah. <laughs> Which confused, wasn't sure it was nay or yay. Boy, talk about getting a lot of attention. Yeah. Uh, they asked him three times, did you right. say no? <laughs> yes, nay. Hey. So did, is that a nay that you said nay or is right, that a nay? Right. <laughs> yes, I said nay. No. <laughs> um, oh, uh, the, uh, Senator Baruth moved that we report S H20 favorably as amended. Okay. Peggy, is there any discussion? Did you say S20? No, I said H. I oh, might have said S, but it's H20. H, yeah. H20 as amended. Um, ready for the vote? Yes, please. Senator Benning. Yes. Senator <laughs> Nick, is that a yes? <laughs> Senator, <laughs> Senator uh, Nishka. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Senator Baruth. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. I'm assuming Senator Benning doesn't want to report. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody else who would like? I'm I'm happy to do it. I you know I worked on it. Or Senator Nick, if you'd like to, you were on the <clears throat> Justice Reinvestment. You're very welcome, group. Senator. Pardon me? You're very welcome to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll be the reporter, Eric. Thank you so much for the work on this. 
Um, sure. Who did the draft of S103, which was that Michelle? Remind me the topic of that one. That's, That's the, um, the Good Samaritan for human trafficking. Yes, I believe that was Michelle. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Is Michelle available yet? Do you know, um, Peggy? I emailed her a couple of minutes ago and told her to join now. So I assume she'll be coming any second now. Um, Eric, you'll give me the clean copy from me after it goes to editing, right? Yes, that one still needs to be edited. So, yep. Senator Sears, if that doesn't come back from editors till tomorrow, is that okay with you? Yeah, that's or, fine. I don't okay. think, I mean, we don't have, it's, it's a House bill, so not a huge rush. Um, right. Thanks. You know, as far as we get it into the. Yep. <clears throat> How long ago did we do Youthful Offender? I know we updated it in 2016, but did we do Youthful Offender back in the 90s. Was yeah, that started back then. That sounds right. Although I wonder if it was the late '90s, early 2000s. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, I, you know, it wasn't widely used. Um, I think it was 1999, Senator. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It wasn't wild, widely used until uh, we did the changes in 2016. All right, Michelle is here, so we're going right. to move to. Um, Thank you, Eric. And we're going to move to you bet. Thanks. S uh, H eighteen, which is the um, sexual ex sexual exploitation. But I wanted to talk. And we don't have to take testimony on it today. But I I do. After talking with Representative Brad yesterday, um, we will uh, consider adding S one hundred three, which is the um, immunity from liability for prostitution, um, sort of a um, good Samaritan law. Uh, if the person reports that and has been a victim of, of human trafficking. Um, and it was part of a bill that the House passed last year that had a controversial study in it, if you remember, of working um, sex workers and it generated all kinds of um, questions. Uh, this didn't seem as controversial, but um, we may ask for testimony on this um, at some point. Well, we will um, take testimony on it. So we, I don't intend to pass H18, um, but we could finish our work on H18 today and then take testimony on S103 uh, next week. Okay. Just so everybody's aware of that. Do, do everybody remembers the issues, I'm sure, that were involved with the sex worker and then kind of took over in the house. And <clears throat> last year. Okay. Anyway, H-18, we were going to hear from Marshall, who was going to talk to an expert. I think we just lost Michelle for a minute. Oh. I can just jump in to say that. Yeah, uh, please do. No, I, I intended to have an expert, um, Carissa Hickok, who's, or Hessek, sorry, not Hickok, who's a professor at North Carolina uh, State School of Law. Um, she is, has been very busy and has not been able to get back to me. Um, she took a preliminary look at the bill, but wanted to see the whole chapter and just has not had time to read that and uh, get back to me with any analysis. Um, I have nonetheless submitted, and it's uh, should be on the website, our office's proposal, which is accomplishes exactly the same thing as the as passed the House version of H18. Doesn't change the elements at all. Um, all it does is eliminate the sentence um, at the end 
of H18, which says something along the lines of simulation applies to conduct and not to a simulated child and replaces that with a change to the definition of child that says uh, essentially that child means an actual person under age 16. The reason we did that, the reason we propose that and the reason we support that is because it's a much better definition of simulation because it doesn't use the word simulation in the definition of simulation. And also because it uses the exact same language that courts use when they talk about simulated child pornography. The courts do not talk about um, simulation applying to conduct and not to a simulated child. They talk about simulation by saying that simulation must involve an actual child. Those are the words that courts use when they do this. The objections to that and the reason why that was not adopted by the House seem to involve this perception that if that is put into the statute, courts will not understand what it means and will do something with it that they, um, you know, they'll do something different than what the legislature intended. Um, I don't think that's a legitimate objection. First of all, there's no examples of courts doing that. There's none. There's no examples of courts looking at the word, you know, a, a state adding the word actual before child and a court going, oh my God, I don't know what that means. I'm going to impose all kinds of obligations on the prosecution that they haven't had up till this point. Um, there are not examples of that happening. I don't think it's a realistic concern. Uh, additionally, there's no examples of, um, I mean, this is in fact, like this language is derived from the language that courts use. This is the language that the United States Supreme Court used in their cases, uh, defining what is and is not prosecutable simulated child pornography. It's the language that the federal courts use. It's the language that states courts <coughs> use when they address this issue because they draw all of their case law from the federal courts. Um, so from our perspective, it makes much more sense to use the language that is both clearer um, and is also the language used by federal courts when they consider these cases, rather than to use language based on a concern that courts are going to misinterpret the words actual child to mean something it doesn't mean because frankly, that's just an unrealistic concern. And so I'm, I'm sorry that we don't have an expert to testify today about, um, you know, the sort of scope of federal First Amendment law. Um, but I did want to make sure that the committee was aware of our objection and that we didn't, you know, we weren't just in this case objecting and saying, don't pass the bill, don't pass anything like this. We actually have a proposal that does exactly the same thing that the, um, as passed the House version does. Um, and our objection is simply that we should be using language that's clear and language which reflects the decisions of the United States Supreme Court and federal courts. Senator Baruth has a question. Um, I do, Marshall. Thank you for that. I'm wondering, um, you say you have a counter proposal. If, if this language um, turns out to be the will of the Senate as well as the House, um, do you do you oppose it actively or are you just at this point saying you prefer one over the other? Do you think there are hazards of passing what the House um, sent us? How would you characterize your opposition? Um, I would say that I don't believe that the House's language is unconstitutional. Um, I think the original language that was proposed was unconstitutional. I think that we've gotten it to a point where it is constitutional. Um, I just think that it is not clear. And I think that when we're talking about, I mean, these are very serious offenses. These have, you know, the sub substantial uh, terms of imprisonment, five years, 10 years, 15 years, depending on which part of the statute uh, you are convicted of, um, lifetime registration on the sex offender registry. When we're dealing with such serious felonies and with charges that have such long-term serious ramifications, I think we owe it to um, the people of Vermont to be perfectly clear about what we're talking about and to use language, especially when we are in this territory of 
you know, trying to create a law that allows prosecution all the way up to the edge of what the Constitution permits, um, but no further, to actually use the language from the court cases that define that scope of the Constitution. So I don't believe that it's unconstitutional. I do think that courts would probably be able to figure out what it means. I don't think it's clear, and I don't think it reflects the language used by federal courts, and I think it should. Okay, I, I, if I could just f finish up quickly. Sure. Um, so uh, my, uh, I won't call it a dilemma because I think I know which way I, I uh, would go on it, but each side is saying that the other side's draft will be productive of confusion. Um, and so I, I look at both possibilities. They, they seem almost equally useful to me um, and much better than the original language that you helped us work our way away from. So um, that's why I was asking if, if you were in any sense actively opposing or seeing risk from this language, but it seems like it's mostly a, a question of art, which is, um, which is more specific and clearer and in line with case law. Um, okay, thank you very much. Could I ask a question? Yep, so Senator White. Marshall, why, and maybe this question is also for Judge Grierson, why did the House people get the impression that the courts wouldn't be able to understand it? I mean, where did that, where did that come from? You'd have to ask um, Attorney Schur. I think all of the testimony to that effect came from Attorney Schur. Oh, okay. Right, and I don't, I don't have any information on it either, Senator White. Okay, so could I ask? David, that question? Yeah, I just want to point out that Marshall's uh, proposal strikes C, the simula that simulation applies to conduct, not to stim not a stimulated, not a simulated child. So he he thinks it's clearer because he uses the word a child means an act any actual person rather than any person under 16 and strikes the part of the definition of stimu stimu simulation that applies to conduct, not to a simulated child. Oh, I'm having some simulation. I think we could follow the law without that language. I don't think it's necessary. The C. Right. Right. David? Thank you, Senator uh, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office for the record. So our concern uh, is, I'd say, the most intense when it comes to changing definitions that apply to the whole chapter, which uh, subsection one of 2821 does do. Uh, certainly, although we've had, you know, a lot of back and forth about the proper way to define simulation, uh, changes to that section would you know, are, are more likely to, the interpretational effects of it are more likely to be confined to how we define simulation. When we're changing definitions that are currently in law and that apply to the all of the crimes, you know, the, the, especially we're talking about the four crimes related to child pornography, that's a very serious concern for our office. And we are worried that it could uh, disrupt uh, prosecutions, which are attempts to keep young people safe uh, in terms of these, with regard to these types of offenses. The adding the word actual, and well, let me back up, you know, courts, when they interpret statutes, presume that each word means something. And currently, there is an, you know, the courts have a general understanding of, of what uh, the child definition means. It means a person <laughs> under 16 years old. Um, and the concern is that by adding another word to that, a court will look at that and say, this must mean something additional to what we already understood. And, uh, it's not clear exactly what they might ultimately decide that additional burden is. It could be, you know, and the defender general's argument is that it's going to be interpreted in line with federal case law. Uh, regarding specifically, um, you know, child, the, the child pornography case law. 
the concerns that a Vermont court looking at this uh, isn't necessarily going to be bound by that understanding. They are going to look at it and say that the, uh, the, the legislature chose to add a new word. We interpret laws such that every word gives a new meaning. That means the term actual must be, uh, or you know, every word means something. They change the definition, which a court could decide means that they uh, intended to change the meaning of that definition. And um, what is it that they intended to add? added a word? What is it? What is that extra sort of element or idea that they were trying to encapsulate? And it could be that instead of you know the the notion that it is a a real child, a living child, that maybe the court decides that it means it's a specifically identifiable child in which there's a specific name uh, and identifier that can be made with regard to that person. I don't know that that will happen, but it certainly seems like a uh, plausible, a not impossible conclusion that a court could make when confronted with a new word. And that could seriously disrupt, if not frankly end, uh, make a, a impossible many prosecutions under this statute and current including currently active, you know, cases that would otherwise, that have nothing to do with simulation. Um, and, and adding that, you know, again, remember, we're talking about changing a definition that applies to everything, whether it's simulated or not. Um, and so that's why our office has very strong concern around changing currently existing definitions. Again, if we wanna to try to tinker more with the simulation section, that's something we can discuss. I can't promise agreement on it, but that's something we can discuss. We're very concerned that this would disrupt on currently ongoing prosecutions for the interpretational reasons I just discussed. Do you have any, I think I understand your opposition to the word actual. Do you agree with Judge um, Grierson on C, Striking C, simulation applies to conduct, not a simulated child. I'll say two things. One, I don't think our office would oppose striking it. I think the Defender General's office would oppose striking that if you didn't change the, the definition of child. Well, we'll um, let him, I'll let yeah, him sorry, say, say that. Speak. You don't oppose that. We, we wouldn't oppose that. Uh, we wouldn't oppose that. I, I would suggest that and, and I haven't vetted this outside of uh, my own thinking here, so I, I want to be a little cautious in uh, stating clear support on this. But it, you know, one thing that you could do is say simulation applies to conduct, not to a child. Um, and I don't know if that, but that might, you know, that that I, I need to think about that a little more. But we wouldn't, yeah. Our, our our my main point here is around the actual and the definition of subsection one. Okay, thank you. Marshall? Any so further again, I mean, I've, I've got to say that there's simply not examples of the concern that the AG's office have as ever occurring, that, that it doesn't happen. Courts are not confused by this language. Courts interpret this language all the time. There's not actually some doctrine which says that if you put a word into a definition, it necessarily changes the definition. And in fact, we don't have case law that says that the definition that's currently used only applies to actual children. In fact, what we have is a general definition of person, which applies to all chapters of uh, Vermont statute, which includes far more than just actual person. It includes all kinds of non-person entities like corporations, uh, parts of the government, but then it also uh, has sort of a catch-all because it doesn't say a uh, person shall mean and then have a exclusive list of things that person means. Instead, it says person shall mean and then, it ha uh, you know, the following things including but not limited to. Uh, it doesn't say but not limited to, but that's, you know, it says including not in some way limited to. So we're already talking about a definition which there's no case law which says that it only involves actual people. There's no defi yeah. uh, statutory definitional law that says it only involves actual people. And in fact, that's a major point of um, 
friction in the case law. You know, the case law, there was a lot of case law about simulated child pornography, which all boiled down to a distinction between uh, child pornography, simulated child pornography that was created using an actual child versus simulated child pornography that is not created using an actual child, one being protected by the First Amendment and the other not. So this, the definition of actual child is actually really important to the scope of the case law, to what it can constitutionally apply to and to what it cannot. And there, you know, the concerns that the AG's office are raising just simply don't exist. These aren't concerns that are valid, that are based on some, you know, actual point of um, distinction that's been drawn by a court somewhere. Uh, these are speculative concerns that frankly don't, just don't make sense uh, when we're talking about this. And it, you know, it's, it's, I've got to say, it's difficult for me to understand what these concerns are, because when you start looking, as I did, you know, when these concerns were first raised, I started going back looking through case law in other states, in Vermont, in the federal court system, for any court that's been confused over the term actual child and believed it to mean something like what the AG's office is concerned about. Like, has there been a court that has said, oh, when the word actual child is used, that must mean that, that the prosecution needs to know the name and age of the child or anything like that. I've found zero cases of that happening. I've found zero cases of anything even similar to that. Um, frankly, the word actual, the, the place where courts seem to get confused is when legislators don't put in the words actual child. That's when courts do things like apply definitions to uh, images used, uh, created using pictures of children grafted onto the heads of adults and things like, or to the bodies of adults and things like that. That's where courts get confused about what the definition of a word child is, not when they use the word actual child. So we certainly disagree. We do not think that this is a clear definition the way that it's written. Um, and we don't think that the concerns of the attorney general's office are legitimate when it comes to courts misinterpreting the words actual child. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I guess I'm gonna um, I think um, I'm gonna tend to agree with the attorney general on this one personally. It's up to the committee where you wanna go. I I also agree uh, with, with the Attorney General's proposal. I, I am interested in discussing whether to strike C. Yeah. That's two. I'm talking about the courts being confused. That's me. What's that, Jeanette? I, um, I'm going to move that we not change <clears throat> just to, for discussion, uh, not change the definition in 2821-1 by adding the word actual. Okay. So any discussion? Well, I would just say that um, Marshall said there's no evidence that adding a word would change the definition in some practical sense, but but of course it does. If you, it's not the same definition. It now has the additional word, and I think we can't know what will be the consequence of that. But I don't think it's crazy to view it the way the Attorney General's office does, and so looking to mitigate that possible consequence. Again, the language seems to do everything we want it to do. And, and it seems like a, a fine point of legal language in which I'm comfortable erring on the conservative side, which is leaving the definition the way it is. Hmm. 
<clears throat> Anyone else? So what does your fine mind, legal mind say? Who's? Joe's fine legal mind. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if it's fine, but I think I'm probably the only one in the committee who has sat in the back of a courtroom while a judge, a prosecutor, and a defense attorney were all scratching their heads over language in our expungement statute that we had recently passed doing my best to cower down behind the chair so they couldn't see me to ask me that question. Um, at the moment, I, I guess I'm going to go along with leaving it the way it is and uh, hope for the best. I'm sure there will be litigation if it's not. Okay. That's a majority. You okay, Alice? Yes. You know, I'm not wanting to change. I hope I'm in the right place now. I'm not wanting to change so, the definition of a child. So now let's discuss whether we should. We're going to leave. We're not going to add the word actual in one. Now we go to section 1C, which is um, striking the words. The simulation applies to conduct, not the simulated child, I believe. Judge Grierson said he agreed that that was not necessary, but I'll let him speak for himself. Well, I I can only confirm what I said earlier, Senator. I, I don't think we have no opposition to striking that the last clause in that uh, section. Okay. I got to go get my dog. <laughs> Come here, Marley. Come here, buddy. You don't need that. Okay. Thank you, Marley. Marley is ex officio. Yeah, he is. Uh, he voted. He, he doesn't want to vote on this. He says it's too difficult. Um, <laughs> David or Marshall? Striking C? Uh, we wouldn't object to it, but my sense is that that would uh, raise constitutional concerns for others. Um, it's our position that we wouldn't object to it. And because of the way we interpret the statute, we believe it doesn't raise a constitutional problem. But again, I'll, I'll let other folks testify. So we don't think that it matters that much. We think that the definition is vague enough um, and unclear enough in using the word it's defining in its own definition, um, that it's not terribly meaningful as a definition. I, I'm not saying it doesn't, like, I do think that there needs to be some definition of simulation that makes it clear that um, simulation does, that in order to prosecute simulated child pornography, it cannot be child pornography that was created in a way that did not involve the sexual exploitation of an actual child. Um, I don't think that that definition does it. Can I ask Mr. Chair? Yep. Uh, um, and I'll, I'll pose this to David, but others should feel free to weigh in as well. Is that the only place and see where we use the phrase simulated child in, in other parts of the law or here? I believe that that is the only spot where those two words appear like they do. And there. am I am I wrong that then by including that we're then we are creating something new that we're not defining, um, and and granted we're doing it by reference to what the law doesn't apply to, but we're still referencing a simulated child as opposed to the child described earlier on, um, if we eliminate C, then I, I think there's the, the implication of such a thing, but it almost seems like if it's going to be there, it should be defined. And I don't know that we want to go through that process at this point. Um, what, what do you think about that, David? I, I think that's a reasonable interpretation. I mean, I, I would not argue that this is 
you know, this 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 language subsection C is the product of discussion and compromise. I wouldn't say it's like the most elegant definition that's ever been put into um, the statute books. I do agree, Senator, that it can be read to add meaning um, that isn't that um, and add meaning along the lines of what is constitutionally required, which is that the simulations we're talking about are simulations of the conduct of the sexual act or whatever that might be, and not um, simulations that um, that create the appearance of a child, whether that's a tech, you know a drawing, a digital rendering, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. I do think it can reasonably be read uh, to cl- further clarify that meaning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, well, I'm trying to read the whole thing. Simulation means the explicit depiction of any conduct described in subdivision 2A through F of this section that involves a child, creates the appearance of such conduct, and exhibits naked genitals, buttocks, or dust below the top of the ruler. I, whatever. Simulation does not include painting, drawings, or non visual or written descriptions of sexual conduct. And then simulation applies to conduct, not to a simulated child. I don't know what that hell that means. Really is confusing. <clears throat> I'm not sure what that means. Senator, I think you know the idea behind it, the concept behind it is just to further clarify that this is within the constitutional limitations. You know, the constitutional the constitution does not permit so under if 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 some depraved individual has a Barbie and is simulating behavior with the Barbie, it's obviously not a child. So we're saying that conduct, while repulsive, is not necessarily criminal. Is that, I mean, can I read it that way? Yes. So um, mm-hmm. I don't, um, <laughs> I don't know what I mean. It says it does not include paintings, drawings, or non-visual or written description of sexual conduct, and then does not. Michelle, how the heck? Yeah. What does that mean? So, um, you know, I think you know we've been working on this issue, this particular issue. Uh, quite extensively with the with uh, David and and Marshall um, before the session started and getting the bill in the bill introduction and then also um, quite a bit in the house and because they have differing opinions on the use of the term actual child um, we're trying to communicate clearly that when Use of the term simulation applies to conduct, and if you if you look at you know the definition of simulation, you'll see it says right there seven a simulation means the explicit depiction of any conduct described, and then it lists that there. But without anywhere else in the statute uh, specifically saying that it doesn't apply to CG and things like that. We wanted to have something in there that was clear that that this that there no one should interpret the simulation to apply to anything but an actual child. But we don't want to use the actual child because, or we didn't in the house because they were trying to kind of uh, go right down the middle between the two witnesses and their positions. I just, from my standpoint, I think. I think this language is fine. I also think the Defender General's language is fine. So I think either works. I don't have constitutional issue concerns about either. I understand the debate between the two and the positions where they're coming from um, about what they think would be clearer or better from a practical standpoint of using it. But I think you can, I think you can use either. And it's really, I think, up to you. I think when it says, I understand the bit about not using a a word to describe a, word, a term, um, but in simulation, it's it's not so much saying simulation means doesn't mean a simulation. It applies to conduct. Um, I mean, I can try to reword that a little bit. I think it would be helpful to reword it, but I do have a question for 
command, is it Commander Raymond or what's the what's Director Raymond? What, <laughs> what's your actual title? I don't want to. Uh, it's actually Commander, but um, Matt, Commander Raymond. I, I'm fine with that. I just wanted to. I don't like demoting people or promoting people by title. So, Commander, does any of this matter to you in enforcing the law? Yeah, I, I would. I would avoid changing the the definitions that change everything because it's not just child pornography under this chapter. There's luring a child under this chapter. And we don't use actual children when we do undercovers for that. We use a, um, uh, you know, a, a police officer pretending to be a child. So I, I would avoid changing to actual child in the beginning of the statute. Um, and I would keep the changes inside the simulation section. I don't think that the current uh, language that's on there is overly confusing. It's really just trying to hammer home the point in case someone didn't get it above where it clearly states this involves a child. Uh, but it's then just re reinforcing that in section C that says simulation applies to conduct, not a simulated child. Again, you're not using simulation to define itself. You're just trying to explain this is just pertaining to the conduct. We're not uh, not CGI children or anything like that. I, I don't see a problem with the way it's drafted. Thank you. I, I would I would see a problem with changing the definition that changes it for everything. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, Thank you. Michelle, if you can work on some language there. Well, let me just uh, put it out there. Would would people be more comfortable if it said simulation applies only to conduct, period? And we Probably. leave out the child bit? I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, it's kind of belts and suspenders for what you have in, in the beginning of the lead-in in 7A. Right, right. And then you just take out the child. And so... Yep. Okay. I think that's better. Sure. Why, don't, why don't we do that and we can look at it next week um, when Peggy and I figure out when we're going to take up S. Um, yeah, S103. Thank you. Um, You want to try to take up S103 next Tuesday? Sure. We, we would need to get in touch with David Micklin. I always mispronounce his word. Micklin, he knows who he is. <laughs> Micklin <laughs> can, can I? Did you hear him when we lost power? No. <laughs> On the other day when we lost power in the floor session? And he was having a conversation someplace with somebody else, and it was being broadcast everywhere. Oh, no. He was dropping some bombs, too. Oh. <laughs> Better him than I. Yeah. Um, he may have some witnesses and others, but if Michelle's ready to walk through 125 next Tuesday, 103, excuse me, 103. Okay, if that meets, are you available next Tuesday, Michelle? I am. 